I've never been one to hold back the truth. If if I learn something is true from the Word of God or true in our world or in history or whatever, I always uh, have been faithful, whether people like it or they don't like it. I've always tried to be faithful to share the truth of God's Word. Now, what I'm going to share with you today, I assure you 100% that it's biblical. You, I will prove that beyond any shadow of a doubt. I have studied this intensely these last several weeks. Um, it, my eyes have been opened to things in the Word of God that I didn't understand, that I did, and that I've overlooked, and that I let certain people and entities in this world talk me out of. But we're going to look at it this morning. We're going to look at Lucifer's greatest global deception. And I trust that if you weren't here the Sunday that I shared this, you have no idea where this is going. Um, this is bigger than the Illuminati. It's bigger than the Freemasons, though they're involved. But it's huge. Um, but before we get into the PowerPoint this morning, and hopefully that will be ready, are we even close to that being ready? Oh, okay. Okay. We're going to play a clip here, but let me read this. This is, um, we're going to read uh, 1 Timothy, 1 Timothy chapter 1, uh, verse 18 and 19. A long time ago, I came across a prophet, a New Testament prophet, who I'm ordained by his ministry. His name is Gene May, Eagles Wings Ministries. Uh, he's out of... Uh, Tampa, Florida area, but he had a church here in Opelika in the 1970s. Powerful man of God. I believe a true New Testament prophet like Agabus uh, in the book of Acts. Truly, I've seen the man walk in the true gifts of the Holy Spirit for over 20 years. In 1989, in November 19th, 1989, he came to Auburn to do some services on a Sunday afternoon, and I still have the cassette tape right here. Uh, here's my witness, Eugene May, November 19th, 1989. Do you all see that? Everybody see that? Still have the, the message that he preached that day on the front side of the cassette tape and on the back side of the cassette tape. He had never met me before. He, we had never seen each other. He didn't know me. He didn't know anything about me. No one had told him anything about me. And he is a, uh, a prophet that operates in the gift of prophecy. And as he walked by me, and let's see, 1989, so November, I was uh, 21 years old, uh, giving my life to the Lord fully when I was 19, and really just doing nothing but seeking after God, fasting, praying, studying my Bible, just t sometimes 10, 12 hours a day. I mean, I was just dedicated my whole life, walked away from the modeling career, the movie career, um, all of wanting to play college football and everything, walked away from all that to answer the call of God on my life. So I'm about two years into that, and I go to this meeting with this prophet I'd never heard of, and he starts, after he teaches his message, he starts walking around and, and prophesying to different people. And right before he laid hands on my shoulder and prophesied to me, the Lord spoke to me and said, you're next. I want to play the prophecy. This is the actual prophecy that he spoke over me on November 19th of 1989. And I want you to pay close attention to it because he says something in here that you'll find interesting, especially those of you who know me have been listening to what I teach and preach. Uh, go ahead, brother, play that. Lord, I thank you for this, brother. And I thank you for the commitment. You know, brother, this is what I see. I see you before God. And I see you kneeling there before the Lord in an absolute contrition, absolute dedication of the Him, just putting your life there, saying, God, it's yours. And God's taking me up on it. God's placed a calling upon your life. 
God's going to have you teach. There's a teaching anointing that's going to come upon you that will be very powerful in the body of Christ. God says, a teacher, in my fivefold ministry, you will be because of the things that I'm stirring inside of you. This is not a day of release, but this is a day of preparation for you. But there will be a day of release when I will launch you and I'll push you forth, says the Lord. And you will walk forth in my anointing and my power. And you shall teach. But they shall not be the things that all would expect, but they will be the things of God that will set the captives free and liberate my body to be what I've called it to be. For you will train many others that will go forth. And they too shall teach. And they shall break the strongholds of the enemy by that taught word, says the Lord. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Amen. And all of the things he spoke to me that day through the gift of prophecy by the Holy Spirit, God had already communicated to me. It was just a confirmation of what God was calling me to do. But what I've always found interesting, too, is the emphasis on spiritual warfare, the emphasis on deliverance, and the emphasis on teaching things that not all would expect, things that are neglected, things that people don't want to teach or, or don't know. And uh, he said, you will teach things that all would not expect, but they would be the things of God. This is one of those things. Now, what I'm about to share with you today is by no means a unique revelation to me. There are others for centuries, actually, and even now there are other preachers and ministers beginning to share this truth. Um, even some well-known ones are beginning to share this truth, and they're catching a lot of flack for it. But um, I want to give this scripture because when you have a prophecy that you know is from God, like I did from Gene, you must war a good warfare with it. And this is what he told Timothy. Paul said to Timothy in 1 Timothy chapter 1, verse 18, This charge I commit unto thee, son Timothy, according to the prophecies which went before on thee, that thou by them mightest war a good warfare, holding faith and a good conscience, which some, having put away concerning faith, have made shipwreck. So... Today is a fulfillment you're hearing of a prophecy that's over 20 years old uh, of things that I believe will set us free. So what I want you to do this morning is let's turn. Uh, we're going to start in the book of Romans, Romans chapter 1. Well, let's just pray. Let's pray for a minute. We need to do that. Hallelujah. Father in heaven, we thank you for today. We thank you, God, for your word most of all. Father, we believe that every word in the scriptures, every single one from Genesis to Revelation, we believe they are inspired by you, that you moved upon holy men and they wrote what you directed them to write down. Every word, every jot and tittle, every part is true and every part is inspired by you. And God, we choose to walk in faith, if we are Christians, born again, believers in Jesus Christ, then Lord, we're supposed to believe your word. And Lord, I pray in Jesus' name that today you will give everyone eyes to hear, a heart to understand, that you will open the eyes of our understanding, that you'll give the spirit of wisdom and revelation in the name of Jesus, that we will see the truth no matter what we see others doing around us. Father, it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Now, before we get started today, we're gonna, I'm going to give you a quote before we go to Romans. I hope you're in Romans chapter 1 is where we're going to start in the scriptures. Um, but this is uh, from the movie The Truman Show. How many people have seen The Truman Show? Remember that movie back in the day? Of course, it's about um, this guy here, played by Ed Harris, Kristoff, who is the creator of this world where he films Truman from birth, even before birth, through his whole life in a world that he created, built in Hollywood. Uh, and you see kind of a model of this world right here. And uh, anyway, he makes this statement here. And I don't know what's going on there, but he says that he's being interviewed in the movie. And this is important. 
he says, the interviewer says, Christoph, let me ask you, why do you think Truman has never come close to discovering the true nature of his world until now? And Christoph answers, we accept the reality of the world with which we are presented. It's, that, it's as simple as that. Think about that for a minute. That'll make sense more as we go into this. Now let's go uh, to Romans chapter 1. Or actually, did I put, uh, this is Romans chapter 3 first. Let's read this. Romans chapter 3, and then we'll back up to Romans 1. Uh, just verses 3 through 4 here. This is what it says. It says, well, we'll, we'll I'll read verse 1 to 2. It says, What advantage then hath the Jew, or what profit is there of circumcision, much every way, chiefly because that unto them were committed the oracles of God? For what if some did not believe? Shall their unbelief make the faith of God without effect? God forbid. Now this is the point I want everyone to listen and get a hold of. He says, God forbid, yea, let God be true, but every man a liar. For the Christian, for the believer, this is our command. Let God be true, and every man a liar. Now the revelation we have from God is his word. We need to let that be true, no matter what any other man says. But I'm going to prove to you today, some of you, you weren't here the other week, I'm going to prove to you that you're believing men, you've been deceived, you're believing men more than you believe in God's Word. I did all my life until the last few weeks. There's particular deception. Now Romans chapter 1 reveals this, more of the nature of this, the importance of this. I'm going to read, I know I'm only going to put up here on the screen starting at verse 18 because it was just going to be too much to put on the slide here, but I am going to read from verse 16. This is Romans chapter 1, verse 16. And remember, my definition of the gospel of Jesus Christ is everything written in both the Old Testament and the New Testament. Amen? We don't get to pick and choose. The Old Testament foretold the coming of Jesus, his death on the cross, his resurrection from the dead, him as the Messiah, the only Messiah and Savior, the healer, the deliverer, everything. And then the New Testament, of course, shows when he came and did his ministry as God in the flesh, died on the cross for our sins, rose from the dead. So the whole Bible is the gospel of Jesus Christ. You can't pick and choose. You can't take one part. You can't say, I believe this part, and I don't believe this part. Amen? Amen. So let's, let's read this. Verse 16, he says, For I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for it is the power of God unto salvation to everyone that believeth, to the Jew first and also to the Greek. For therein is the righteousness of God revealed from faith to faith, as it is written, the just shall live by faith. Now, before I go any further here, the just. That means those who are in right standing with God must live by faith. But what is faith? True faith is believing God's word first. Romans 10, 17 says, For, So then faith cometh by hearing, and hearing by the word of God. All true faith is based upon hearing, understanding, and believing in your heart what God says, above what your own eyes see, above what men tell you, you believe God's Word. Amen? And that's where faith comes from. So we must live by faith. And that's why the Bible says that we are to walk by faith and not by sight. Second Corinthians 5, 7. We walk by faith and not by sight. Everybody say that with me. We walk by faith and not by sight. So that means we walk by faith in God's Word. Amen? Amen? We're not to be moved from God's Word by what we see or what we hear. I'm stressing this for a reason. Now let's keep reading. He goes on to say, For the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men who hold the truth in unrighteousness. Now I'm going to show you in a second, but the Greek word here for hold means withhold or suppress. So he says there, who, who hold the truth of God in unrighteousness, because that which be, may be known of God is manifest in them, for God has showed it to them. Then he gets even more specific. He says that there are men who are suppressing or holding the truth, living in unrighteousness, 
But God has manifested it to them and showed it to them. And then he gets more specific. He says, for the invisible things from the creation of the world are clearly seen, being understood by the things that are made, even his eternal power and Godhead, look at that, so that they are without excuse. So the Bible tells us here that there are men whom God will show the truth. He will show them the truth and they will suppress it. They will hold it back. And it particularly has to do with the creation of the world. Uh Uh-oh. And then he says that it's so overwhelming, the evidence, that these unrighteous men will be without excuse. Then he goes on to say, because that when they knew God, they glorified him not as God, neither were thankful, but became vain in their imagination, and their foolish heart was darkened. Professing themselves to be wise, they became fools, and then I skipped a few verses, who changed the truth of God into a lie. Who changed the truth of God into a lie. And worship and serve the creature more than the creator, who is blessed forever. Amen. Now, I'll just show you these words here, the word hold here, cat echo, to hold down in various applications, have, hold fast, keep, and like it says here, retain or withhold. So there are men, he said, who will hold the truth, who will hold back, suppress the truth. They know it, but they'll hold it back. What's interesting, he says, he talks about the creation. When he says the word creation, it literally means the original formation of the world. Y'all with me? All right, let's keep going. Now let's turn to Genesis. Genesis chapter 1. Now let's look at the creation again. Now I'm going to say this. I did a message a number of I guess it was now a year or so more ago about the gap theory. I still believe this is in play in this situation, that there is a gap of time. We don't know how long between Genesis 1-1 and Genesis 1-2. But that is what I'm going to share with you today. It doesn't change that. I do believe that, by the way. But let's read this. He says here, Genesis 1.1, in the beginning, God created the heaven and the earth, and the earth was without form and void, and darkness was upon the face of the deep, and the Spirit of God moved upon the face of the waters, and God said, let there be light, and there was light, and God saw the light, that it was good, and God divided the light from the darkness, and God called the light day, and the darkness he called night, and the evening and the morning were the first day. Verse 6, and God said, let there be a firmament, in the midst of the waters, and let it divide the waters from the waters. And God made the firmament and divided the waters which were under the firmament from the waters which were above the firmament. Is that what your Bible says? Okay. And the evening and the morning were the second day. And let's just finish this. And God said, let the waters under the heaven be gathered together into one place and let the dry land appear. It was so. And God called the dry land earth. And the gathering together of the waters called he seas, and he saw that it was good. So here we see that God said that we have waters below the firmament and waters above the firmament. Now, I'm going to give you just here the definition. We'll get to it in just a second. But the definition of firmament in the Greek is the Greek word rakia. And we'll show this in a second. But rakia means in the Strong's, really gives kind of a simple definition. It's called the visible arch of the sky. I'm going to show you that the Hebrews and the scriptures bear out that this arch is believed to be solid. All right? And that it's a dome over the earth. Now let's read this. This is, I'm going to give you several translations here. This is the complete Jewish Bible. I happened to go, we went to the, um, What's it called? The Explorations of Antiquities Museum in LaGrange. There's only three of those, what, in the United States or in the world. 
seven places in the world, three in the United States, I think. Anyway, I just happened to pick up the complete Jewish Bible and looked at Genesis chapter 1, and this is what it said about Genesis 1, 6, and 7. It says, And God said, Let there be a dome in the middle of the water. Let it divide the water from the water. And God made the dome and divided the water under the dome from the water above the dome. And that is how it was. Now, this is God's Word. Let's look at some more translations. We'll go to the next one. Uh, this is uh, the Bible in basic English. Translates it very good here, actually. It says this, and God said, Let there be a solid arch stretching over the waters, parting the waters from the waters, and God made the arch for division between the waters which were under the arch, under the sky, and the waters that are over the sky. Everybody say this with me. Waters under the sky... Water's above the sky. Water's under the dome. Water's above the dome. Okay, let's keep going here. Here is the Brown Driver Briggs Hebrew and English lexicon, just to give you more, for the term firmament. This is a breakdown here. It says extended surface, solid, expanse, beaten out. You're going to see in a minute. Beaten out means like metal. It's beaten out. And then it means also the vault of heaven or firmament regarded by the Hebrews as solid and supporting the waters above it. Everybody say solid and supporting the waters above it. Okay, let's keep going. Now Job thirty eight seventeen. See, what most people don't realize is, of course, apart from the book of Enoch being the most ancient writing that we have, of the books contained in, the, in, in our biblical canon, it's pretty well agreed upon that the oldest book in the Bible is the book of Job. Now, Moses came after Job, and God took him up on the mountain and gave him the book of Genesis and the creation, you know, um, but he was, he was showing him back in time. But in chronological, what was written, Job was first. And Job has a lot of information about the creation, the nature, true nature of creation. Not what NASA's told you. He says here to Job, Job thirty-eight seventeen, Hast thou with him spread out the sky the visible arch, which is strong as a molten looking glass. Now let's look at these words. The word spread out here means to pound the earth, means to expand by hammering, to beat, make broad, stretch. So that's what the word spread out means. Here's, a, here's a, a, an illustration of what this Hebrew Scripture means here, this is someone with a hammer beating out metal into a dome shape, thinning the metal as they beat it out. Okay? Let's keep going. The word strong here means strong usually in a bad sense. It means hard, bold, violent, stiff, um, strong. Everybody say strong. Okay? Let's go to the next one. Here's the word for molten. This means to pour out, by implication, to melt or cast as metal, extension to place firmly, to stiffen, to grow hard. So what I'm getting at here is the Bible says that there are waters above the firmament and that this arch where God created this firmament is firm, right, and supports waters above Okay? I'm about to blow your mind here. Because see, what you've been told is outside of Earth's atmosphere is the vacuum of space. Have you been there? Have you seen it yourself? Yeah. Was it reversed around? Okay. 30, 37, 18. 
let me let me uh, before we go any further too. Let's go. Let's look at this. Now this is I actually took a picture of that book right there, sitting on my leg. <laughs> the complete works of Josephus I have, and have had for years here. Josephus, the first century Jewish historian that lived from say 37 A.D. to past 100 A.D. at some point. Uh, he's one of the most quoted. He's the most quoted um, non-Christian person of history that about Jesus and his works, but he gave a history of the Jewish people going, starting all the way back into creation and uh, up into his day. But here's what he said, and this is in book one, chapter one, it's entitled The Constitution of the World and the Disposition of the Elements. And Josephus wrote, quote, after this, on the second day, he, God, placed the heaven over the whole world and separated it from the other parts, and he determined that it should stand by itself. He also placed a crystalline firmament round it and put it together in manner agreeable to the earth and fitted it for giving moisture and rain and for affording the advantage of dews. On the fourth day, he adorned the heaven with the sun, moon, and other stars and appointed them their courses and their vicissitudes of the seasons might be clearly signified. So just giving you that this is the Jewish theology. This is the Jewish revelation of the way heaven and earth was created. All right. Now, let's read this here. We read that in Genesis 1, 6 and 7, God made the firmament. He divided the waters under the firmament, which is the solid, hard dome, and he exports the waters above the firmament. Now, in... That was in the creation around the time of 4000 B.C. So we go forward to 2500 B.C. And it says in the 600th year of Noah's life, in the second month, in the seventh day of the month, the same day, all the fountains of the great deep were broken up and the windows of heaven were opened. Windows were opened in the dome to let in water, massive amounts of water. So the fountains of the great deep broke up, massive amounts of water came down, right? The earth was flooded. There's evidence of that. And in fact, there's a record in, in all ancient cultures that there was a great flood. So this is not even debatable. The, the agnostics, the, the so-called scientists and the atheists and everyone, they want to debate the fact that the, the, the geological evidence of the flood is everywhere, and it's in, in, in every historical record of every ancient culture, including the Babylonians, all the way back. And then, of course, we come to, still in 2500 B.C., in Genesis 8, 1 and 2, it says, And God remembered Noah and every living thing and all the cattle that was with him in the ark, and God made a wind to pass over the earth, and the waters assuaged, and the fountains also of the deep, and the windows of heaven were stopped, and the rain of heaven were restrained. So he, he puts a difference between the windows of heaven, waters, and the rain. It was not the same thing. The windows of heaven were closed, so that water was stopped, and then the rain that came from the clouds within the sky, the dome, the arch. Now what most people believe, and we've been, been taught by creation scientists, is that that water that was dumped out from high that flooded the earth, that it's no longer there. That after the flood, that God used that water to flood the Noah, and somehow he ran out. And he did away, and, and people say he did away with the firmament, and that's why we can go into outer space. But we'll see in a minute, can we, really? Um, but here we have a problem in Scripture. Can't believe that because we've got to believe Scripture, right? Can't believe one Scripture and not believe the other. So we, move, we, we fast forward 1,500 years after the flood. And the Holy Spirit had the psalmist write this in 1000 B.C. or 1,500 years after the flood. Praise Him, ye heavens of heavens, and ye waters that are above the heavens. Now, do we believe that God's Word is divinely inspired by Him? If so, the waters that were above the heavens still there. 
What is this alluding to? Well, if we're going to let God be true and every man a liar, that means NASA's a liar. I'll prove that in a minute. But it does help us understand something. Maybe this is the real reason they train in a pool. Maybe this is a reason that we find that their spacesuits are equipped with emergency snorkels inside. This was on Fox News. Now let me explain something to you. They talk about here that these emergency snorkels for spacewalks are in case they lose pressure in their suit and they could just bend down and breathe through that. No, I'm, I'm sorry. Uh, in the empty vacuum of space, if you were to lose your pressurized suit, you did. Okay? Snorkels would only help you in water. If water came in, your helmet, not the empty vacuum of space. They get caught in all their stuff all the time. But this is just a side note. See, this is where people are going to start thinking that, that Pastor Dean is in a crazy land. But I'm going to preach the Bible to you, and I don't care. God's true, every man a liar. Let's keep going. Now let's look at something else here. <laughs> I wonder how many of you figured out where we're going. Proverbs 8, 27 through 29 is wisdom speaking. And wisdom is speaking. Now, I believe that this wisdom that is speaking is Jesus. Because the Bible says, in him, in Colossians, in him are hid all the, the treasures of wisdom and knowledge. And that before he became the Son of God and became God in the flesh, he's always been the eternal word, but he's also always been the eternal wisdom. Okay, And so he says, when he, God, prepared the heavens, that is the visible arch of the sky, wisdom says, I was there. When he set a compass upon the face of the depth. This is talking about the original creation, remember, when God's spirit moved on the waters, but it says he set a compass. And when he established the clouds above, and when he strengthened the fountains of the deep, and when he gave to the sea his decree that the water should not pass his commandment, and when he appointed the foundations of the earth. Foundations of the earth. Well, let's look at these words in the Hebrew. Here's the word for set here. When it says he set a compass upon the face of the depth, it means to hack or engrave or to scribe simply, to be cut in stone or metal tablets. So what he's saying here is that literally he inscribed or he cut. He set a compass. Well, let's see what compass means. The word compass here means is the word kung, and it means a circle or a circuit. Okay? So when God began to make the earth, he says he created the heavens of the earth, but the earth was without form and void and darkness. So the material, the earth itself, was created, and I believe it was destroyed a long time ago by a cataclysm between God and Satan. We'll get when Satan fell. And that's why it was flooded. But when God decided to come and make the place for which we live, says that he engraved a circle. He cut out. A circle. Let's look at this right here. Another translation even just says it correctly, mind you. When he established the heavens, I was there, wisdom said, and when he drew a circle on the face of the deep. Everybody say with me, circle. circle. Not ball. Circle is not a ball. Keep going. In Isaiah 22, verse 18, the Lord is speaking and says, He will surely violently turn and toss thee like a ball into a large country. 
the Hebrew word for ball is not the same as the Hebrew word for circle. Two different Hebrew words. So there is a difference in the Hebrew language between ball or sphere and circle. Okay? Everybody with me? And then, of course, Isaiah 40, 22 says, It is he, God, that sitteth upon the circle of the earth. Not the ball. Let's keep going. Now, Job 38, 14 says this about our earth. It says, It is like clay under the seal, and its features stand out like a garment. Now, this is not King James translation, but I'll give you King James. Let's go to the next one. The King James says, It is turned, and the word turned in Hebrew means changed, as clay to the seal or the signet ring, and they stand out as a garment. So these are signet rings like the old kings would use. And you would take clay, lumps of clay or lumps of wax, and you would press them down. Back up. Can we back up to this slide before? What do you see here? And the, it's interesting you see that the border comes up around. All right? Now this is your Bible. Here's what I'm trying to tell you this morning. The very nature of what you've been told about the earth is wrong, according to the Bible. Because they're telling us that there's not a solid sky and there's not waters above and that it's not like clay flattened out by a signet ring. Let's keep going. Circle, disc, or sphere. Say, Pastor Dean, are you telling us today that the earth is really flat and not evolved? According to your Bible, it's flat. And you know that most, athe most atheists and agnostic and scientists, they laugh at us because they know the Bible teaches that the earth is flat, and that there is an underworld, hell, Sheol, Tartarus, the abyss, that there is the flat plane of the earth, and that there is a dome over the earth, and that God sits above that dome. Let me tell you, if it's a ball, there's no up and down. But the Bible is a book of up and down. How can... Beneath, when he says hell beneath in Isaiah 14, how can hell beneath, how can I stand on the northern hemisphere? You see what I'm saying? There's an up and down. There's an above. This is the actual flat earth map that's really been around for centuries. The center is the North Pole. And in fact, it's the only magnetized point. That's why all compasses all point north. There's no pointing south with a compass when you supposedly go toward the South Pole because there is not a South Pole. God inscribed a circle. And it says he put a boundary for the sea. The Bible speaks over and over of scriptures, the end of the world. Funny, the movies bear this out. Pirates of the Caribbean at world end. What's interesting, when they're headed toward world's end, they're in the ice and the snow and the iceberg. Let's keep going. You want to see what it looks like? 
there it is. Now, the truth is, what, what many of you don't know is that there's a thing called the Antarctic Treaty that certain governments of the world have made this place off limits to you and me. You can't fly over it. The only way to prove what I'm saying is wrong is someone would have to fly due south, go all the way around and come back to the North Pole. You know that that's never been done? nor has it been allowed. No fly zone over the Antarctica. Now, there's, they'll let little tour boats come and let you take some photo op shoots on the... But you're not going to get to get your own team together and go on and explore. Do you want me to tell you why? Because they know you're going to find what they've already found. That's where the dome comes down. why it's off limits. And let me just say this about the Antarctic. If the Earth were a ball or a globe with its so-called tilt and our so-called revolutions around the sun and our spinning, if it were true, then the temperatures and the climate would be very similar in the, in the Ar Antarctic as it is in the Arctic. Not not at all similar. The coldest place on the earth, very different. How does that work with day and night in our cycle? We're going to get there. That's a good question. Okay. We're going to get there. Um, but that is a very good question because I'm going to blow your mind as well. But let me let me say this about this. In 1947, between 1947 and into the 1950s. There was Admiral Richard Byrd had what was called Operation High Jump. You can see it was a massive military movement. Now, there is belief that the Nazis established a secret base there, and that was one of the reasons that we had such an extensive war group sent there. But Admiral Byrd was known for his exploring, and especially he had gone to the Arctic, and so he was... Uh, tapped to lead this expedition. When he came back, he was saying things that he found. Certain other people that were with him were locked away in Bethesda Medical Hospital, told they were crazy, and then fell from a tall building. When Admiral Byrd came back talking about finding hollow earth, which is mentioned in the Book of Enoch, but what's really interesting to me is, see, I believe that it was right after this expedition, 1959, and it was officially concrete by 61, off limits. I believe they found what they were looking for. Now, remember how we started this. I told you, there, the Bible says concerning the original formation and creation, Romans 1, that there would be men whom God would show the truth to. They would see it fully. But they would withhold it from you and me. Okay? I believe he saw it. And frankly, I believe that most of the high Illuminati, Freemasons, and government officials of the world know this truth. In fact, I'm jumping ahead, but I'll show you in a minute that the United Nations logo is the flat earth map. They're mocking us. Okay? They know that it's real. All right, let's keep going. There's just uh, a couple of the things for the Antarctic Treaty. There it is, looking it up, just Googling it. Now, here's some scriptures. I'm just going to give you a few. Something you, some things you need to think about that just, you believe fairy tales. We believe fairy tales. Okay? We've believed that the earth is spinning 
at 1,000 miles an hour at the equator, while it races at 67,000 miles an hour around the sun, while the sun in our entire solar system spins and flies through the universe at 670,000 miles an hour through the Milky Way galaxy. With all this movement and spinning, the stars in our sky never change. The constellations continue to rotate. Even if you believe we were orbiting around the sun, when we were on the other side of the sun, we would have a different view, wouldn't we, of the stars, the constellations. Can you imagine moving through the universe at 670,000 miles an hour for years and years and years and years and years, and yet the constellations have never changed? The Polaris star has never moved. That's impossible, my friend. In fact, the Bible never said that we revolve around the sun. The Bible's always said that the sun revolves around the earth. I'll show you that in a second. But let me give you a few scriptures. The earth is fixed, God said, immovable. NASA, Copernicus, theories by Freemason says, no, that's wrong. The Bible's wrong. We're really orbiting around the sun and hurling through space. You know why they wanted to make the sun the center and not the earth the center? Because they were sun worshippers. Devil. Also, gravity. Let's just think about this for a second. We're told because the earth is spinning at a thousand miles an hour that this gravitational pull is what holds us to the earth, right? But think about this. Gravity has to be strong enough to hold the gazillions and gazillions of tons of water from bulging even a little bit on this so-called curvature of the earth, and yet it's sensitive enough to let me jump and escape it, or a bird, or a butterfly. How can it hold trillions of tons of water to the earth, perfectly flat, mind you, and yet a dog can jump in the air? They use the stupid illustration of the ride at, at the fair where you're pinned. But notice you're inside something, glued and can't move. Now, we're in a pressurized system, and what holds us is either the pressure created by waters above and waters below, or it has to do with electromagnetic. But it's gentle enough based on, I guess it could be based on what our, uh, the amount of electrons and atoms in our body, and that's why it's different for me as it is for a butterfly. But it ain't gravity. In fact, Newton kept saying in his book over and over again, if, 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 and he never completed it. It's all theory, people. The Bible says this about the world. Look at this. 1 Samuel 2.8. He raises up the poor from the dust. He lifts the needy from the ash heap to make them sit with princes and to inherit a seat of honor. For the pillars of the earth are the Lord's and on them He has set the world. He set the world on pillars. 1 Chronicles 16.30. Fear before Him all the earth. The world also shall be stable that it be not moved. Stable, not moved. Or Copernicus, NASA, we're spinning, orbiting, and hurling through space. Let's keep going. He says right here, Psalm 93, 1, The Lord reigneth, he is clothed with majesty. The Lord clothed with strength, wherewith he has glorified himself. The world also is established that it cannot be moved. 
Oh, worship the Lord, Psalm 96, in the beauty of holiness, fear before him all the earth. Say among the heathen that the Lord reigneth, the world also shall be established, that it shall not be moved. Do you see that? Psalm 104, verse 5. Who laid the foundations of the earth should, that it should not be removed forever? The Bible says the earth is fixed, immovable. That's why the stars, the nations, never change. Now, let me show you what the Bible said. You want me to show you what the Bible said? Go back to Genesis. I don't even know what the next What's the next one here? Well, I'll, I'll look at that in a second. But, but go back to Genesis. This is something that blew me away here. We just had a question about the sun and the moon and the stars. The sun's not 93 million miles away, y'all. In fact, trigonometry and geometry can prove how far away it is. But they don't want us to know that. Because they built this thing up for 500 years, this lie Satan has. And let me just say this. Why did I name this Lucifer's greatest global deception? Because this entire lie began 500 years ago. And it was crafted to do one thing, to make people doubt and not believe in the God of creation and his Bible and his Messiah. That's why it was created. It's the greatest hoax and the greatest lie, I think, that Lucifer has ever created. And he has enlisted his people, world leaders, astronauts, and I, we must have skipped the slide from... I said, you know, there is a global conspiracy. And we were told in Psalm 2 that the world leaders and the, and the kings and the rulers of the world, and particularly it's, a, it's an end-time passage, would consult together and be against the Lord and against his anointed. So this conspiracy is huge. And a great part of it is not just a one-world government. It's not just about the economic system and the mark of the beast. It is about the strong delusion to make you believe a lie. And I believe part of the strong delusion has been perpetrated by space program. Let's go back to Genesis chapter 1. I told you all this will be the most controversial. Because, see, you've been taught that this thing right here, this globe, you've been brainwashed because they put it in front of you from the time you could see. This ball, 25,000 miles in circumference. Curvature. You've been brainwashed. Because let me ask you something. Who supposedly, allegedly, has the only picture from that far enough away that shows us it's a ball. What if you discovered that those pictures are fake? Who do you believe? And this is what I said to our church when I preached it a few weeks. We're really down to, do we believe God's word or do we believe NASA? That's what we've really come to. Because we have to take their word by faith because we hadn't been out there. Yes and yes. Okay. And 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 listen about circumnavigation. Let me just say this: it works the same way on the circle, the disc, as it does on the ball. Except just flatten this out here, and if you start on this side. You just go this way. You just go around the dinner plate, and you end up where back where you started. You just can't go north and south, which no one ever has. All right? But look at this. We're going to get all those things. We're going to get to all that. Genesis chapter 1, let's look what it says. 
some things that we've believed that's a lie. And I know I'm going to lose people. I know people are going to choose NASA over the truth of God's Word. I know that. I know a lot of Christians. They're going to stop listening to me. I don't care. I, I debated with the Lord. Should I hold this back? Because once I began to see it, the presence, I felt the peace of God, the presence of God. I studied the Word, and I had to say, it's in the Scriptures. There's also some evidence I'm going to give you. Now, there's always going to be people trying to debate and debunk evidence. But the bottom line is, you you, you got to make up your own mind. For me, it's settled because God's Word says it, and I'm going to believe Him more than I believe NASA. Remember, these scientists also tell us we came from monkeys. Right? They also tell us that everything came from nothing, somehow in some just chance, no creator, right? So you keep believing them if you want to. You can believe them that they went to the moon. I'm not believing them about anything anymore. In fact, they didn't go to the moon. But let's look at this first. Creation. Now let's go down. Oh, let's go down to verse 14. About to blow your mind here. Let God be true and every man a liar. Correct? All right? Here's what it says. And God said, let there be lights in the firmament. What did we discover the firmament was? The visible arch that creates our sky, our atmosphere, God said, let there be light in the firmament, not outside the firmament. Is that what the Bible says? Guess what? I've checked many translations in Hebrew. We've learned this morning in Genesis, the waters are above the firmament. The firmament is a solid, crystalline, Glass. And the sun and the moon and the stars are inside here. And there's evidence of these things. Also, we've been told that the moon reflects the light of the sun. It's not what God said. God said he made two lights. Jesus said when he comes back, the moon will not give off its light, not the sun's light. They've proven that plants react differently and that sunlight is different from moonlight. Completely different. The stars are not millions and gazillions of light years away. They're in here. And that's why as this in here, they move in here continually and never change. Remember, I read a minute ago Josephus made this statement that when God created the sun and the moon and the stars, he set their courses. Guess what? That's what the Bible says. He set their courses. Well, let's keep going. Here's another picture. Here you have the abyss, the fountains of the great deep, the foundations of the earth, the pillars of the earth, the solid dome, with places they have windows for, the sun, moon, and stars within the firmament, as God said, and the waters outside. This is what your Bible teaches. All right, let's keep going. Here's another illustration of the same. Okay, go to the next one. Sun, moon, and stars. This is what happened. The sun moves in this pattern. as the moon does. And when the sun's here, it's dark over here. And what it does to create the seasons is the sun will move in a little bit as it moves here. And that's why Antarctica, I mean not Antarctica, but the Arctic, the North Pole, will has a season of no night. The sun is like a spotlight moving around the earth. Guess what? Psalm 19 says this. 
Let's go to the next one. Oh, yeah. It's, it's complete bunk science. In fact, NASA even had to admit, recently admitted, there's more ice at the Antarctica than less. So it's not, this planet's not warming. But again, here's another little illustration of how it's working. Okay? Let's go to the next one here. Now here's proof. Now there's numerous videos, numerous, because you know these iPads now have these time-lapse photography and videos that they can do, and you can go on the internet, and, and there are people not even believing this, not even looking for this, and they're, they're doing these time lapses of sunsets and sunrise, and what they're finding is there's clouds behind the sun. Watching there be clouds and the sun come into focus, if it's 93 million miles away, that is an absolute impossibility that there could ever be a cloud behind the sun. There are numerous videos and pictures of this. Uh, this particular one, a couple of German guys, I got Andrea, she speaks German to translate, they were freaking out. It's behind, it's behind, they're freaking out. The clouds are behind. It's not 93 million miles. In fact, it is believed that the sun is 32 miles in diameter. Think about this, what the Bible says. We've been told that our sun is a star, and it's one of the smallest stars in the galaxy, in our Milky Way galaxy, right? The Bible says that stars will fall to the earth in the last day. If one star the size of our sun fell to the earth, the entire earth would be wiped out. The stars are not these huge things. There's another picture. Notice. Cloud in front, cloud behind. Let's get another one. Look right here. Look at this one. This one, I watched the video of this one going down through there, and that cloud still being there. Now listen, look at this verse, Job 37, 21. Very interesting. It says, and now men see not the bright light, which this means the, the morning sun, which is in the cloud. It's in. And that's what we just read in Genesis. God made two great lights. In the, put them in the firmament. There's also videos and pictures of clouds behind the moon. Okay? Let's keep going. Here's Psalm 19, 4 through 6, what I mentioned a minute ago. This is King David under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit. He says, there, first of all, Psalm 19 starts out with the, talking about the firmament showing God's handiwork. So the context is God's creation, particularly the firmament, or what he made within the dome, within the arch of the sky, shows his handiwork, and then he says this, their line has gone out through all the earth, their words to the end of the world, so there's got to be an end somewhere. In them he has set a tabernacle for the sun. In them. In them. He has set a tabernacle for the sun, which is as a bridegroom coming out of his chamber and rejoices as a strong man to run the race. His going forth is from the end of the heaven, the arch, and his circuit unto the ends of it, and there's nothing hid from the heat thereof. The Bible says that the sun is like a man running a race in a circuit. Not us, not the earth, going around it. The sun does not go down. It moves away from us to the point that it, it, it converges with our line of sight to where we can't see it anymore. This is a time-lapse photo of not the sun going down, but moving away. Let me show you the perspective here. Look at this hallway. This hallway is perfectly level, but the way we see a long hallway, what starts happening? Look at this light that would appear. It looks like this light is moving down, but if we were down here, it would still be the same height. It's our line of sight. That's why ships look like they're going over the horizon. They're just escaping our line of sight. We can't see infinitely. 
What a lot of people have done, they think ships have disappeared over the horizon and they put a telescope or a zoom lens on it and it's still there. There's no curvature of the earth. Our vision, our perspective, I listened to the testimony of a young man on the USS Okinawa who operates our Sparrow missile system, works with the SEALs. He said that the Sparrow missile system uses line of sight, he said RF waves or lasers, to target ships. He said he has line of sight on ships 60 miles away. At 60 miles away, the curvature of the earth should put that ship over 2,000 feet below the horizon on an earth globe that's 25,000 miles in circumference, meaning there's no way you see a ship 60 miles away. So listen, folks. This is, this is how it works out. The, the so-called curvature, right, what they tell us, the math, the first mile, it drops eight inches, but then it's squared and it goes to 32 inches at two miles, three miles, six feet, four miles. So that's how far. If you're at sea level, you're, you're looking at sea level, that's how far. Now let me show you something here. Look, I got 20 miles, 266 feet of drop behind the curvature of the earth. At 56 miles, 1,873 feet of curvature drop, right? Let's look at this. This was taken last year. This guy's a professional photographer. He lives in Michigan. This is the Chicago skyline viewed and photographed from 56 miles away across Lake Michigan. He's standing on the shore of Lake Michigan, and he takes this picture. It made the news. The newsman, though, the ABC newsman, said, oh, no, it's just a superior mirage that happens when conditions are right, that this is really below the skyline. This is the goose who tried to tell us that. Problem is, is that... This is what happens a superior mirage. When there are certain conditions on the water, a superior mirage will always appear to be the invert. It will be inverted upside down and on top of the object. Let's look at another one. I've got several. Here's that. See how it's inverted? Higher, but inverted. Uh, here's another one. Ship. You can see it here, how it's inverted on top of itself. Another one ship inverted on top. So those are called superior mirages. Um, the picture of Chicago skyline, and let me just say this, I can verify that I watched this guy do a time lapse of it. So he's got video and pictures. 56 miles away. Now the tallest building in Chicago, which used to be called the Sears Tower, now it's the Willis Tower. Uh, let's go to the next one. I can't remember what's... Now here's where I use the Earth curvature calculator. You can go use it. I put the man standing on the beach at six feet tall, and then I put 56 miles. So the level target hidden height was 1,873 feet should be hidden. The tallest building in Chicago is the former Sears Tower, the Willis Tower. It's 1,450 feet, so nothing of Chicago skyline should be seen if the earth is curved like a ball. Now, there are many people right now, even some PhDs now who are catching on to this, who are going out and doing their own test on the curvature of the earth and finding there is none. So if they're lying about something as simply verifiable as what they've taught us in the school books, and I've got, I've got so much information, lighthouses that are viewed from 30 miles, 40 miles, 50 miles from ships at sea. To me, 
I have God's Word, and then I have some clear, verifiable evidence. We want to go do our own at Mobile Bay. And then we can say we've done it ourselves. Let's keep going. Here's where you could look up. This was a time-lapse photo, I mean time-lapse video uh, on another day, and as it cleared, I mean, is this inverted? You're even seeing the, the lights on the building. This is supposed to be the, the city there. The build, all the buildings should be hidden below 1,873 feet. So, these, so, so 400 feet above this building should be where you're seeing if the earth is curved. All right? Now, these are two alleged NASA satellite pictures of the Earth. <laughs> Does anybody notice anything funny here? Huh? Well, yes, there's no stars. Uh, do you see this? Let's, let's, huh? Well, I'm going to get to it. This gives you where they're taken from directly from NASA. Let's go. I went ahead and found the, the pages. These are these are NASA photographs. They claim are photographs. Here we go. This one they say, this particular one, they say was the satellite view of America on Earth Day, April twenty second, two thousand fourteen. Um, from the uh GOES E satellite, they said, they claim. So they claim this was last year and you see this the size of the United States on the uh, on the map. I guess the sun just happens to always be perfectly right behind the satellite, so there's no shadow casting on it. Um, this one was taken. This is the blue marble image of Earth taken from the V2 RS instrument aboard NASA's Earth observing satellite. They they claim, of course, this composite image uses a number of swaths of the Earth. So they're saying that this satellite is going around, and because it's not far away from the Earth, far enough away from the Earth, it's just taking these images as it goes across. The problem with that is, why are you using a composite image of a satellite that's taking swaths of the Earth, supposedly, when we have sent stuff out to Pluto, supposedly? We can't take a picture, just a clear picture? No, because this stuff is bunk. Here's the same. These are the same two. This is from the, uh, well, no, this is a different satellite picture from Earth. Notice, notice this. Now, you could say, well, it could be different distances, but the problem is, is look where the curve of the Earth, Watch, look at this so-called curve of the ball here. Notice, I could have started here, but this is the edge of the United States, California, over here to Maine. Look at here. It covers, do you see this? These are fake photographs. This is bad Photoshop. And then this is NASA. Well, we got a picture from 1975, 2015, 2007, 97, 2007. What does it look like? It's all inconsistent. Look, look at the size of the U.S. here versus here. It's insanity. And they want us to believe. Now let's keep going. Now, we all agree, if you have one light source, the sun, in the, middle, in the daytime, all shadows are going to go in the same direction. They can't crisscross. You have to have another light source to make them, right? Let's keep going. Here's the Apollo 11 pictures. Do you notice something? Shadow here going this direction, but the shadow of the astronaut going this direction. There's also a hot spotlight behind him. Looks like he's in a spotlight. Let's keep going. There it is again. This is a BBC documentary, by the way. You, do you know that most of the rest of the world does not believe at all that we went to the... We're the only idiots that believe it. Yeah. Most of the Russians don't believe it. The, the, the British, they don't believe They don't believe it. And they got good reason to. All right? Look at this one. He 
keep going. It gets, it gets worse. <laughs> Look at the, the astronaut shadow going this direction and the rock shadow going that direction. They didn't take lights to the moon. They admit that. They didn't take spotlights to the moon. Now, the cameras that they used, the video cameras and the, the picture cameras they used, had these etched in the camera, these little crosshairs, right? So the crosshair should always be, the legitimate photo should always be on top of whatever object they're shooting. These are taken straight from NASA's website. Notice that crosshair is behind. So the picture was taken, and then this was brought in afterwards. Doctored photo. Let's go to another one. It's up close. You see that? Keep going. Apollo 11, right? Supposedly we were first time, first time on the moon. See that piece of equipment there? Zoom in on it there. Go ahead. Oops. Let's go to the next one. Oh! Took the picture. Then you put the flag in and you took another picture. Behind the astronaut. Go ahead. Now, I looked up, I went to NASA's website myself. Those that I just showed you are from documentaries showing that the moon landing was a hoax. In fact, Apollo 11, Apollo 12, Apollo, all of them. I looked this up. Let's back up one. I looked this up because, for some reason, I think, oh, you just can't see it. Oh, you just can't see it. It's not, it's not dark enough. Well, they doctored it here. I found this myself. Let's go to the next, see if you can see the next one. I noticed, and you'd have to, I can show you these on my computer to be clear, but this was behind this astronaut's leg, and they came in later and tried to put another line to put it on top of it. This line's thicker. So they did a bad job trying to cover up their foul up there. This is what I looked up on their website myself, um, and that was Apollo. So now, I, I'm not going to play this. This is uh, a... Uh, a video that was released when they were doing a documentary on the moon landing and somebody said either they released it by accident or a whistleblower who wanted the truth to get out but this was actual footage of Apollo 11 astronaut they did go up they go up as high as they can where the air gets thin okay but it showed how they were making it look like they were far from earth the whole thing shows them in the capsule with a circular window of Earth at high altitude. And it shows them putting a piece of cardboard in the window, turning all the lights out in the capsule, backing away and making it look like they were far from Earth when they weren't. The, the full thing, you got Houston talking to them, Buzz all, but you got, it, 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 it's all a lie. NASA is a bunch of lies. Okay? Um, here's another official NASA photo and supposedly when the lunar module was landing on the moon in one sixth gravity it still had to have a 10,000 pound thrust jet engine, rocket engine to help it land safely well I guess they forgot to put their landing crater because this ground is not disturbed at all and in fact, the scientists who were deceived by the other scientists were so afraid that the, that when the lunar module was going to land, that the 10,000 pound thrust engine was going to create such a crater that the lunar module might fall into it. And yet, there's not a piece of dust moving. I can show you this because on the landing feet of the module, look at this, not a speck of moon dust. It looks like it was just set there by a crane. You know why it looks like it was set there by a crane? Because it was. There's another one. Look at this. We land on the moon with a 10,000 pound thrust engine in one sixth gravity in a vacuum of space. You know, we got pictures of them riding around in the, in the little land rover thing throwing up dirt or moon dust. But 10,000 pound thrust engines didn't throw any on there. Come on, man. I guess you like my, what I call him, astronaut.
In fact, he's a he's a thirty he's a thirty third degree Mason, Buzz Aldrin. Now here's something that a lot of people don't know about. Right after World War One, as we were winning the war, there was Operation Paperclip. How many have heard of Operation Paperclip? Operation Paperclip was a secret operation okayed by President Truman, worked out by the CIA, to bring hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of Nazi scientists, doctors, psychologists, and so on, into America. Warner von Braun, Nazi officer, came the head of NASA. Yep, and it's all exposed. This is not a conspiracy theory. Let's go to the next one here. Warner von Braun. But NASA's founding is much more dark than just the fact that it was equipped by both NASA and uh, Area 51, all of our rocketry stuff. There was another individual involved. Some people say Truman didn't authorize it, but he did. Um, but some of these guys, Werner von Braun, Arthur Rudolph, these are men, this, this stronghold, these are men who did experiments on human beings to their death. These were evil people. And we brought them in, gave them American citizenship, and let them head up NASA, and also they ended up heading up the psychological departments of the CIA that gave us MK Ultra and everything else. The CIA, NASA, the Jet Propulsion Laboratory, everything was led by former Nazis and occultists. Let's look at this right here. How many of you have ever heard of Jack Parsons? I wrote about him a little bit in my, in my book. God was trying to lead me in this over the last few years. Because as I was writing The Polluted Church, and I got to looking and tracing all the, the little rabbit trails, right? I came across Aleister Crowley, of course, the most wicked Satanist on the face of the earth, and found out that when he came to America in the 1940s to create a, uh, his satanic group here, uh, he teamed up with a guy named Jack Parsons. Jack Parsons was known, even Warner Von Braun said, that Jack Parsons is the father of modern rocketry, that he is the one that developed the rocket fuels, and he's the one that's really uh, the, the founder and the father of the Jet Propulsion Laboratory that became NASA. And Warner Von Braun even says he's considered the father of modern rocketry and, and the space walk, but it was really Jack Parsons. Jack Parsons was teamed up with Aleister Crowley and L. Ron Hubbard, the founder of Scientology, and Warner Von Braun and Walt Disney, they created basically what became the Church of Satan in San Francisco, in California. Um, they said that, that Jack Parsons, before every rocket test launch they did as they were developing the the rocket fuels and the rocket engines and the different rockets, they said he would do his occult ritual dances to Pan right before every launch. Uh, you can look up for, for him, but this, this just says Aleister Crowley, Jack Parsons, said, what does an avowed occultist, the founder of the Jet Propulsion Laboratory in NASA, a science fiction writer and founder of the Church of Scientology and an ex-Nazi turned American's foremost rocket scientist and Walt Disney, founder of the Magic Kingdom, have in common? Oh, you might be surprised the extent of their collaborative efforts in Babylon. And they would do rituals, they said, to bring up Babylon. I mean, they were in deep, these men were deeply involved in Satanism and the occult. These are the founders of NASA, the Jet Propulsion Laboratory, and the Church of Satan. So let's keep going. There you have Jack Parsons. That's the, the group. 
Well, let's keep going. Look at this. This is a medallion, a 1979 medallion made to commemorate the 10-year anniversary of the moon landing. What do you see on there? Our flag is on the moon, 10th anniversary on the front side. The Supreme Council 33, the double-headed eagle, order out of chaos, the Freemasons, and then on the back they're just plainly there. Almost all the astronauts of the Apollo program, the Gemini program, the Mercury program, including John Glenn, Buzz Aldrin, are Freemasons. I thought, I wonder why Freemasons, and then it dawned on me. Because they're good at keeping secrets, but they get killed. Gus Grissom, the astronaut who was killed, what was it, Apollo 1, he started talking. He was, a, he was a Freemason, but he started talking about they would never make it to the moon, and there were so many problems. And he even said before he died in one of the capsules on the launch pad, he said, if something happens to me, it'll be them. Because he was starting to talk about there's no way we're going making it to the moon. So he's a dead man. But many pictures are taken, and you see their messianic rings. You, know, you can even go to this website here, freemasoninformation.com, and go to the astronaut page, Messianic Astronauts, and you can find a list and tell you what lodge. In fact, I didn't know this, but Edwin Eugene Buzz Aldrin was inducted into the Freemasonry, into Freemasonry, at the Oak Lodge in Montgomery, Alabama. Yep, that was pretty wild. Yeah, see, it says right here, initiated Oak Park Lodge, number 864, Montgomery, Alabama, on February 17, 1955. He became a Freemason in Montgomery, Alabama. Um, let's keep going here. Now, many of you have seen the Illuminati card game that came out in 1995 that revealed a lot of things that had yet to happen, including, as you see, the, the terrorist nuke card here shows the Twin Towers being struck and exploding just like, looks like, just like 9-11. You see the Pentagon. You see right after that Saddam Hussein, the oil spill. There's, there's several, the gun control card, martial law, all that. What a lot of people don't realize is there were two other cards as well in the Illuminati card game back in 1995 that shows they know about this. Look at this. Flat Earthers and NASA. The Flat Earthers card and NASA card. And the NASA card shows that it was all staged in a uh, studio, which is, they made a movie about that in 1978 called Capricorn One that really exposed the whole thing. Uh, I remember seeing that movie back when I was young, too. But notice this. The Flat Earther card says this on here. It says, calls it weird conservative, right? But it says, people laugh, but the flat earthers know something. For their action, you may roll two dice, and then it gives you what you do in the game. It says, uh, the flat earthers' weird alternate geology has led them to a gold strike and all this stuff. But anyway, it's interesting that that issue is within the game there. Now, I just promised I'd show you this. This is the flat earth map. And notice the UN. Now, why would they have that? See, I believe this. I believe that there's certain knowledge that these, in, these people that in the know, they have to leak. Why? That God's made it a requirement upon them. They have to leak it because Jesus said, there is nothing hidden that shall not be known. And everything done in secret will be declared from the rooftop. So they have to do it. Now, let's show you. We, we've got some videos. You got the videos ready? We'll deal with that in a second. I'm going to show you the videos. The first one. This is the one of the first amateur rockets, the fastest and the highest amateur rocket ever fired. It's called the Go Fast. It was launched in 2014. It reached an altitude of 73 miles and hit something and dead stuff. You want to see it? Let's watch it. Our mission is civilian space exploration. First civilian team in history to launch a rocket that reaches space. 
Hear the air sitting out. Dead stop at seventy three miles. Reverse camera on the left, front front camera on the right. All right. All right, the next one is a NASA video of SpaceX, which is supposed to be a private space organization, but they're really a subcontractor of NASA. Uh, you will see this rocket nose begin to scrub on something, begin to smoke, and then finally blow up. They're going to show it in full regular speed, and they're going to show it in slow motion. So just watch this. Very similar situation. Altitude 32 kilometers, speed at one kilometer per second, downrange. Lots of the nose. Kilometers. And you come back, shows the vehicle on course, on track. And here it is in slow motion. See the nose? Hit something, keeps going, keeps pressing, friction builds up. So I believe that they've been trying to blow holes in this dome. I'll tell you why. Right after Admiral Byrd's trips to the Antarctica, immediately we started sending up nuclear weapons in the high atmosphere to detonate them. And it was called <laughs> was called Operation Fishbowl. You find that interesting? I find it interesting. Um, what's the next one that I have? Huh? Here's a look at just kind of a model of the season. This is for for Rob Skiba. He he's he's put out a lot of good information. He's a pretty well known minister. It teaches on a lot of this stuff, but he's having a hard time. He he knows that all this evidence is building. He knows it's scriptural, but he's still struggling. But he gives you a little idea there. He just didn't do the shadow for day and night, but to show you how the sun moves out, and that's why that you have a drastically, it never gets as close here as it does to here, and that's why there's a drastic difference in temperature and ice here versus at the, at the Antarctic. And I mean, it's drastic temperature differences. Um, anyway, what, I can't remember what's the next one. Oh yeah, the, this one is another, this was supposed to be, this next one is a time lapse supposedly from NASA of the Galileo satellite showing a time lapse of a 24, 25 hours of the Earth spinning, right? Let me show you something that proves that it's false, it's fake, all right? Do you notice anything about that? Twenty-five hours, not one cloud moves or morphs or changes. 
bad computer animation. Now, I don't have it for you, but even the footage, recent footage, put on YouTube and on the Internet by NASA of the so-called so uh, International Space Station flying over the Earth, compare that with what Google Earth says about the position of all the, the, the thousands of satellites that are like a swarm of bees all around the Earth. And as the International Space Station supposedly flies around the Earth, you don't see one. Not one. Anywhere. I thought, how convenient. I don't have to, I could spend the entire morning showing you fake footage from NASA like, uh, they did one where supposedly one of our probes looked back toward the Earth and the, moon, and the moon had moved in front of the Earth. They showed that the dimensions are off. Somebody did the math and the incomplete dimensions of what the moon, what they say the moon is, completely off. So, so what I'm getting at is you can't trust these people. Nothing that they do. Now, let's the, the last one. I want you all to see this. This and the Illuminati controlled media, there's these little clues they drop all the time. Watch this. Hunger Games, Simpsons movie. Game of Thrones, the ice wall. And they called it the end of the world. The Truman Show. Under the dome. 1998, Dark City. thoughts. The Bible says when Jesus comes, every eye will see him. Now how is that possible on a globe? And not everyone has iPhones and TVs and iPads and internet access and nor will they at that point because things will be very bad. When Jesus was ascending to heaven before the apostles in the 500, the angels stood there as Jesus ascended straight up and it says he ascended straight up. And the angels turned and said, You men of Galilee, why stand ye looking into the heavens? He said, This same Jesus, which is taken from you, will so come in like manner. He will come from up. There is an up and there is a down. It says every eye shall see him when he comes. The Bible also talks about Matthew 4, that Satan, and Luke 4, that Satan, when he was tempting Jesus, when Jesus was in the wilderness, fasting 40 days and 40 nights, and he took Jesus out into the wilderness, and it says, the devil taketh him up into an exceedingly high mountain, 
and showed him all the kingdoms of the world in a moment of time. When Satan declared that he would go and overthrow God and take the place of God, he said, I will ascend above the heights of the clouds. I will ascend into heaven above the heights of the clouds. You hear that? In the sides of the north. The Bible says that God sits upon the circle of the earth. Listen to this. It says heaven is his throne and earth is his footstool. I don't know about you, but most footstools I look at are kind of flat and have some legs. Has an up and a down. Right? Let me ask you something. Am I preaching Bible? Is it going against everything you've been taught? It's hard when that happens, isn't it? But something I know about this. I asked the Lord because I knew this was going to cause... There's there's such a cognitive dissonance in us. But I asked the Lord, and he said, he said this. He said, did I not say, and this was the Sunday when I was praying whether I should share this or not. This is the first time in my life I actually said, do I hold back this truth because I will be thought of as crazy? I'll be even further rejected and that, looked at as a nut. Will that keep people from hearing things that I, other things that they need to hear me preach, that I preach on that people... And so finally, one day I was praying, and I asked my whole church to pray for me that morning, should I share it or should I not share it? And we were having praise and worship, and I just felt the presence and the glory of God come over me. And he said, did I not say that the heavens and the firmament and the creation reveals my glory? And I said, yes, Lord. And he said, why would you hide my glory? If you want my glory, then you have to say what I say. We've been praying and wanting God to do signs and wonders and miracles. But he said in his word in Mark 16, he said, signs follow the preaching of the word, not the preaching of NASA. Will we let God be true and every man a liar? I've only presented you a little bit of the evidence. You will find things as you're reading the Word, again, talking about the ends of the earth. That's some powerful stuff. But the Lord just released me. He said, you know what? You just give it to Him. Um, huh? Yeah, there's more evidence about flight paths airline flight paths. Um, You'll look at stuff like a a flight from Santiago, Chile to Perth, Australia in the Southern Hemisphere. Let's throw that Earth map back up here. Yeah. Yeah, we're done with this thing. This is a creation of liars. But it's been effective. I can't tell you in in researching this how many people have chosen to believe NASA and Copernicus instead of believing God, what God said about his creation. Um, But see, what's interesting is on this, let's just look, Santiago, Chile, here. On this globe... There, the, the shortest flight to go to Perth, Australia would be to fly down here in the southern hemisphere, fly right, right across here, right? And that, wouldn't that be the shortest path to fly? This flight, direct flight, does not exist. Now, they'll, they'll have hundreds of flights going all kind of different ways, Right? They'll have one that says they go there, but you can never book it. It's just a, it's a ghost flight. It doesn't exist. Why? Because this flight right here 
doesn't go that direction. So what flights you see is from Santiago, Chile to Perth, Australia, what you'll see is, for some reason, they go way up here to Los Angeles and then come down here to Australia. That sounds crazy, doesn't it? Not on this map over here. You know why? Santiago, Chile is here. Perth, Australia here. Go straight through Los Angeles, California. And the shortest distance between two points is a straight line. Yeah, you can do that all day. You can have fun. And the miles aren't right. They'll tell you that so many miles from, from Perth, they'll tell you this, the globe model mile, but the flight path miles, oh, no, 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 not the same. And let me ask you something. Do you think that, that airlines, just for the sake, would waste fuel and time instead of taking the direct route? So you can't get any direct route in the southern hemisphere. You can get all you want up here in the northern hemisphere. Why? Because look here, to hop over here, to fly like I have from Atlanta or New York to Nigeria, to France I've flown to, to Israel. Look at that, direct flight. Not from here to here. There are men, now I didn't read it, I could read it this morning. I don't know how, what time we got. 12.30, actually I'm doing pretty good. I, I Really, there's so much, I'm not even covering it all. But there were men in the 18, in the 1700s, in the 1800s, we got one minute, that toured the Antarctic coast and logged 60 to 70,000 miles as they tried to go see where this went. 60, do you hear what I'm saying? 60, one, one voyage logged 69,000 miles. It took them four years, and they never found their way all the way around Antarctica. So that kind of stuff's not allowed anymore. Folks, the entire, according to the ball, according to NASA and these boys, all the way around the Earth, circumference, 25,000 miles. How in the world did he log 69,000 miles in four years and could not find the end of that Antarctic coastline? And, and the curvature of the Earth test, they're abundant. You can just, just go online, look up lighthouses. We're out on Blog Talk. So now, I'll tell you what we'll do, since I really cut this short because I didn't read you this stuff. I didn't read you all those accounts. I have them on the iPad. But yeah, let's do some questions. Here. Who was it? Okay. That's a good question. How do you know there are other planets? <laughs> what do they look like in the sky? They look like stars. Right. I believe, let me say this, I believe there are planets, but I just believe they're stars. Like, and I don't believe they're stars like we're told they're stars. But now let me, let me blow your mind for a second, okay? According to the book of Enoch and according to the Bible, there are stars. When God says he commanded the stars, he commanded them to to, to stay a certain path. The sun is commanded to stay a certain path. The moon is commanded to stay a certain path, certain circuit. He talks about these stars and as if they are living entities. I'm, I'm going to blow your mind here. Okay. According to the Bible, Revelation 9 is one place. He says, I saw a star from heaven fall to the earth, and a key was given to him, the bottomless pit. Stars are angelic beings. You say, how do you know that? Hebrews chapter 1 says that he makes his angels ministering spirits, he makes them flames of fire. And Enoch tells us, and even God says, the stars who do not obey God's commandments to do what they were ordained to do in the heavenlies, 
are, some of them, he says, cast out into the outer darkness, which is outside the dome. And that's what the book of Jude calls, and the book of Enoch, which he's quote, Jude is quoting Enoch, and he's saying they are the wandering stars. So I believe the planets are these disobedient stars that are really angels. The falling stars, now this is what the book of Enoch tells us. The book of Enoch says that a star that chooses to become disobedient to God fall to the earth and becomes in the appearance of a man. <clears throat> that would be why we have the story in, in, in Job 38, it talks about the sons of God, the morning stars it calls them, singing when God, made, when, when God was making the earth, creating the earth, right? That's why it says in Revelation 12 that Satan, the dragon, took one-third of the stars to the earth. That's why we see when they fell to the earth, when they came to the earth, they became like men and had sexual relations with human women and created the giant. Well, if they're much smaller than what we know. And again, I'm telling you, I believe some of them are inside the dome and some of them are the wandering stars outside the dome. But it's been, it's been revealed, for instance, that if all of those stars out there are massive suns like ours, that the universe, there's nothing in the universe that would be dark. It would all be lit up. I think it is. I, I, and that's what, as I was studying this, I really began to see, and especially you get these hints, and again, these, these high Illuminati Satanists, these high Luciferians who make the movies, they keep showing you they want to break the dome open. Yeah, you can see that. Right. Yeah. And what I think was Operation Fishbowl in the 1940s and, uh, and through the 60s, when they were exploding the, the nuclear bombs in the high atmosphere, that they were trying to knock holes in it, and they found that the nuclear weapons were not strong enough. So CERN became, which started in the 1950s, became a scientific effort to try to figure, to, to find a particle more powerful than the nuclear weapons to break open the dome. I think they really believe that if they can, if they can break open the dome, they can get to God and destroy him. And remember the Babylonians, what was it? We will build us a tower to the heavens. We always thought that was just figurative. They actually meant it was literal. It was literal. Right. But you also mentioned something about the term you thought might be trying to break open the portals that will allow demons to come allow oh, to yes. deal with the fight, right? Right. Okay. Now think about this. If, according, and I love this, according to Enoch, according to Jude, that these wandering stars who were put out, in, in, in Enoch says he was taken to the ends of the earth. And he said he saw there the, the places, openings to the underworld. And he also saw there that between, God showed him that between heaven and earth, he said, was what he called chaos, the darkness. He was a terrible place. Now, listen, the Bible says this. Remember, can we bring back up um, the, one of the models like the, uh, the, that shows the dome and the sheol and all that? I can't remember what slide it is. But he saw all that, and he, he said that when he was taken to the ends of the earth, that he was allowed to see out here, and that this was, 
was outer darkness. It was a dark place. And what's interesting is the book of the book of uh, the book of Job talks about Leviathan, uh, basically a, a demonic, satanic creature, but being in the waters. And God can so uh, out here in this water, out is dark and, and it's chaos. And I believe what he says about it that there's that there's wandering stars or those entities out here that will appear as lights, but that um, they're looking for ways to get back in here. And also we know that there are certain demons in the abyss and fallen angels in the abyss below. So we have them above and we have them below. They want in here. And I believe the ones that are in here are trying to teach men how to break open these windows and release these from these pits, and that's what CERN is about. All witchcraft and occult rituals are to try to bring demons and fallen angels from their world and their realms into ours. And so when it says, I believe when he's talking about in the book of in Matthew 24 and in Revelation, when he's talking about the stars falling from heaven, I believe that that's, those entities are going to be let in. Islam. Yeah, hang on, hang on. Well, Islam, I mean, Islam, I, I'm going to say something here because this is just for us. I was telling my wife. See, I still believe we have people groups who have much, much deeper or much higher degree and level of Nephilim blood in them. Um, people can call it demon possession. I think it's even more than demon possession. Because normal people don't act like these people. I mean, it's, I, I, I just, it's hard to fathom that. That's why I told her, I said, it's hard to fathom that we have such a massive group of people who are, who are who, you know, who will cut your body open and eat your liver and kill children and molest children and just randomly torture and kill anybody and, and, and smile as they shoot people in the head and cut people's heads off. That is psychotic. It, it, to me, it's beyond demonic. I think something is deeply, deeply wrong all the way down to their core to be like that. So um, I think that, that these entities that are definitely, I believe the abyss was opened in 2008, the beginning of CERN, and I believe the Bible reveals that the I believe the angel came down, and I believe the abyss was open in 2008. And I believe there's more. Again, I believe there's more coming from the abyss and more coming from the outer darkness and chaos. You know, the Bible talks about outer darkness. Jesus talked about people being cast into outer darkness, and then he talked about people being cast into hell. It's two different places. Um, and now I understand that. I never understood that before, because some people talked about when they would die. You hear these people who had near-death experiences, and some of them talking about they went into a dark place that was terrifying evil, and in other places talking about they were being burned in fire, in a pit. See, there's different degrees of punishment. It all, if, we, if we're not walking with Jesus on Judgment Day, it would all be separation from God, but there's going to be different levels of that, different degrees of that punishment. But that, that's why, too, the Bible says in Revelation 20, it's the final judgment, the end of the thousand years. It says, death and hell will deliver up the dead in them, and then they will be judged, every man according to his works, and those who are not written in the Lamb's Book of Life death and hell will be cast into the lake of fire, and that is the second death. So you have all these, these regions down here that are a lot of crazy stuff going on. But here's what's funny. See, I believe that God is revealing this truth, and I believe he wants a lot of the church to reveal, because I believe it's going to get revealed. And then a lot of people are going to look at us and go, well, this was in your Bible all along. Why didn't you know this? Why didn't you preach this? Why didn't you tell us? And I believe it's just important that we know the true nature of things. And, and this is something, listen to me. If, folks, if we're going to believe in a man that came to earth who was God in the flesh, if we're going to believe that he was God, that he never sinned, that the Romans nailed him to a cross and killed him, and on the third day he rose from the dead... Don't tell me you've got a problem believing that the stars are really angelic beings. Don't tell me that you have a problem believing that the sun and the moon and the stars could be in the firmament, not outside. You, you get what I'm saying? If we're going to believe the supernatural aspects of the Bible, 
the abyss, the fallen angels, the demons, the entities, the wandering stars. If we're going to believe, we've got to believe it. Let me tell you something. The occult world, the Satanists, the Freemasons, the Illuminati, they know, and the world leaders know. See, can you pull up that clip? I want to, I want to show this. It's on uh, Scrawny's uh, Men in Black when he's sitting with him. I want you, because this, this is the three lies that they want you to believe, because it all ties into this. It all comes down to this. I believe the great delusion began 500 years ago. And the final leg of it is coming, but it's all based upon this understanding that the entities that are, they're going to bring into the world, that they're going to open up, they're going to call them aliens. But they're not. But you'll hear it in, in Men in Black when... Tommy Lee Jones is sitting on the bench talking with Will Smith, and he's the decision this after he chased down this alien, giving him the decision whether he's going to join Men in Black or not. And he gives you three things, he said. Have you found it? Okay. And uh, and and yeah, there it is, right there. So many commercials. You remember when YouTube, there wasn't commercials? Before? All right, Peter, here's the deal. At any given time, there are around 1,500 aliens on the planet. Most of them right here in Manhattan. And most of them are decent enough to start with a living. Cab drivers. Oh, not as you think. Humans, for the most part, don't have a clue. They don't want one or need one either. They're happy. They think they have a good need on them. Well, my life's a big secret. People are smart. They can handle it. A person is smart. People are dumb, panicky, dangerous animals, and you know it. 1,500 years ago, everybody knew the Earth was the center of the universe. 500 years ago, everybody knew the Earth was flat. 15 minutes ago, you knew that people were alone on this planet. You imagine what? No. Tomorrow. Imagine what you will know. The catch. Catch. What you'll know tomorrow. The three lies they want us to believe. The earth is not the center of the universe. Because that means you're just random chance. That the earth is the center of the universe and the only place where there's life. And it's God's, where God's constant focus is. You see? You see how we, we put the weird speck out here in the Milky Way galaxy, insignificant, all happened by accident, a big explosion. You're not significant. And then they had to create that the earth is not flat, it is not a dome, because that had to discredit the Bible, the Creator's Word, the Messiah, and also to set us up for this outer space that we can go outside the dome and that we're going to have other life from other planets and galaxies come to be with us. So the lie, that was the third lie, that the second lie was to get us to believe the third lie, which will be these are entities from, you know, Andromeda or the Pleiades or whatever. And it's all a lie. They will have come from the outer darkness or they will come from the, this. You know what's amazing about this? is I believe, remember God gave Adam and Eve, he said to Adam, I give you dominion over the earth. Dominion over the earth. That's everything. The foundations of the earth, what's under the earth, hell. Remember Jesus said, the gates of hell will not prevail against the church. I've given you power to bind and lose in the heavens. I've given you power over everything in the earth, above the earth, under the earth, in the seas. He said, in the waters. Now it all makes sense to me. I've always wondered, well, what are demons doing, in the, fallen angels doing in the water? Now it all makes sense. And he says, I've given you power and authority. I've given you dominion. 
Well, see, man was given dominion, and then man disobeyed God and gave Satan dominion. But man still has great power and great authority that God delegated to him about the earth. And that means all of the earth. The dome is part of the earth system. The underground, the abyss, shield, it's all part of the earth system that God created. I believe that God is allowing man to be led by Satan and given knowledge by these fallen angels to actually bring all of this upon themselves. They're going to open those gates in the sky, under the earth, and when on Judgment Day, God's going to say, you're without excuse. You knew every bit of it. You, you opened the door to hell. You did it. I didn't do it. You did it. I just didn't stop you. That's the worst thing God can do, isn't it? Do us. Let us do what we're going to do. Somebody else have a question right here? Go ahead. Um, so does that mean you do have, like, you do have a chance of going through the moon? Yeah, that's a good question. I don't know. The moon is quite a mystery because people who have been re-looking at this again and testimonies now are saying that the moon is a very unique thing, that we're not quite sure what it is, and that it actually at times, as it goes through its phases, creating its own light, that it's see-through, that you can see stars and things through it. Um, so to me, it's a bit of a mystery. Um, I don't know. And, and I, I want to say this. Listen, you guys. There are people who have been studying this for years. I still have a lot to learn about this. This is a whole new realm for me. So I don't know... There's, there's other people that, that have gone further. This. And, and, and let me just say, and, and please understand, you can, you can start doing your own research, and you should. But there are also, just like in any other sphere of church or religion or whatever, you're going to find wackos. If you come across a guy that calls himself Lord Stephen Christ, stay away from him. He is an absolute wacko. But he's talking about flat earth. I believe he was just raised up to try to make people who start are starting to believe. There's really a big move. There's really a big awakening happening to this issue, to the questions, to the inconsistent. People are starting to just say, "I want to examine the evidence. How come there are clouds behind the sun? How come um, NASA fakes all these photos? Why? I mean, these are legitimate. Why we can go out and test and there's no curvature of the earth, but we've got all these scientists and physicists saying that there are. And then but we've got the testimony of engineers who lay bridges and canals and everything going, we never allow for curvature. No. No, you're talking about hundreds of feet. Different. Yes, sir. The the deepest that anyone has ever drilled is the Russian project, and they were only able to go seven miles. That's it. Twelve kilometers. That's it, as far as anybody. So they, no one, you, you know, you see these things in your in school books that show you the the crust and the core, but it, nobody knows because nobody's drilled through the crust. Nobody's made it through the crust. So how do we know? We don't know how thick it is. <laughs> That's what has been reported. Now, I, again, I wasn't there, and you, you know, we weren't there, but I don't doubt that. You know, I mean, I've heard testimonies of people who said that they've been deep underwater and heard these things. There's a testimony in one of the videos 
that we watched of a man who was filming, not a Christian, filming for the, the Blue Planet series they did, and said that he was under the water in the Gulf of Mexico, found an opening down there that was also water. He said, but when we tried to descend, he said it was like a lake underneath the ocean. He said in the submarine, they tried to descend, and it, and it bounced off. It wouldn't go down. I'm just like, there are things that I believe that I think there are things that even they know about. Russia, even we know about, about the depth, the abyss, the fountains of the great deep, and all this stuff that they're not, they're suppressing. That's why I started this off with men who hold the truth and are right withhold it and unright. Yes. They did say the Russian, I read this, the, the Russian deep drilling cola, whatever project it was called, said what they found down there so shocked them that at seven miles they found porous rock with water in it, salt water. So at seven miles they were finding water, not just our regular normal water table. So again, confirms about that underneath the crust there is a great greater there's 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 an ocean below us folks and there's an ocean above us and then there's the oceans in there <laughs> oh yeah that's what we told him last week now you know why the sky's blue and why rainbows my wife sent me a picture i didn't even get i, was, I work forever on this and trying to work around it but i'm going to show you all this on my phone she sent me this was it this morning or last night you ever wondered why, and, and these, there we go. This is a picture. These are pictures of real rainbows. Just like the art. Exactly. Well, the throne of God, remember, the Bible says that God sits upon the circle of the earth. He, he, he sits on this dome, the above, right? Heaven is in the north, above the dome. What does the Bible tell us in Revelation? I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to freak you all out here. What does the Bible tell us in Revelation about the throne of God? Around the throne is a rainbow. The dome is a is glass, transparent glass. When God so chooses, he allows us to see part of the rainbow shining through. Literally from heaven, I believe. Mm -hmm. He talks about that the clouds hide him. Now, you want to get even crazier? Let's get a little crazier. Go to Revelation 15. If we're going to go crazy, let's go all the way, right? <laughs> and this is just something I discovered yesterday that now makes a whole lot more sense. Can we throw up, uh, it's not too hard, that picture of the dome again? So, so is the metal... Okay, this is what I'm going to explain. Yeah, this is you're, you're you're heading in the right direction. Okay, because all right, listen to this. The Bible says. All right, let me get where are my glasses. All right, this I just discovered last night, but it makes it, it makes a whole lot of sense. All right, Revelation 15. Right. Well, all right. Well, let's back up first. Um. Let me let me find it. Okay. Revelation twenty one first. Let's look at this. <laughs> wow, well we can just take some time here. Okay. Now well let's pull up the Hebrew one. If we can. All right. See this is what it said that this is the gate of heaven and this is the heaven of heavens. This is the, the water outside is the second heaven. This is the firmament. Here, and this is the first heaven, second heaven, third heaven, God says. But this is where God sits. 
right here on what the Bible calls in front of him a sea of glass. Literally a sea of glass. This is his footstool. Remember? Let's read this. Revelation. Uh, let me. Here we go. Here we go. All right. Revelation 21. Go down to verse 21. He's describing the city. He's describing heaven, right? Look what he says. 21. And the twelve gates were twelve pearls, and every several gate was of one pearl, and the street of the city was pure gold, as it were, transparent glass. Hear, hear me. The Bible tells us that the streets of heaven are made out of pure gold, but it's so pure that you can see through it like glass. But it's pure gold. Okay? Is that what your Bible says? All right? Now, gold gives a yellow tint to it, right? <laughs> I got to freak y'all out. I mean, I know the Beatles were high-level Satanists, right? Aleister Crowley, whole nine yards. Listen, they had a song. Now, remember, what they say is, is that the dome, the Freemasons even admit this, that the, the, the dome has a yellow tint to it. But it's transparent as well. So what we're seeing, the water on the sides, we're seeing the snake sky look blue. But the dome is actually like the transparent gold. Yellow. The Beatles have a song. Now remember, water above, water below, yellow dome. We all live in a yellow dome. Yellow submarine. A yellow submarine. Submarine means it has waters above and waters underneath it, underwater. It's gold, but it's transparent, see-through, glass-type gold. That's why Josephus said crystalline. That's why God said it was, it was hard like a molten glass. Remember, you've got to remember, God said that there are things that man's eyes cannot figure out that we he's made stuff that we haven't we can't even comprehend right right now look at this let's go go to go to revelation 15 all right verse 1 he said and i saw another sign in heaven a great and a great and marvelous seven angels having the seven last plagues, for in them is filled up the wrath of God. Verse 2, And I saw, as it were, a sea of glass mingled with fire, and them that had gotten the victory over the beast and over his image and over his mark and over the number of his name stand on the sea of glass, having the harps of God, and they sang the song of Moses. He's saying those who make it up here will stand on the sea of glass. It all connects together. And what did Jesus do? He walked on water. Think about that. There's something significant. And remember, water is Pretty much what is, what are we, what is it, 90% water or whatever? And the Holy Spirit is referred to as rivers of living water. Water, 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 all the time water. I got something else. Let me, let me throw a little something else at you. He talks about, that God talks about, that he has portals or doors in the heavens. All right, in this here by which he allows to come in and brings in wind current. This is both in the scriptures and this is both in the book of Enoch. Okay? I'm about to tell you something. In the Hebrew, the word for Holy Spirit or the Spirit of God is the same exact word used for wind, ruach. Right? 
Jesus made an interesting statement. I'm going to really freak y'all out. When he was talking about John 3 about being born again, he was talking to Nicodemus and he said, he said, um, he said, the wind. He said, you don't know from where it comes and you don't know where it goes. So is everyone that is born of the Spirit. Now think about this. The Bible says God, in the book of Enoch, both says God opens these doors and allows him to flint. On the day of Pentecost, when the Holy Spirit came and filled the 120, it says he came as a rushing mighty wind, a literal wind. Okay? Did not Paul say in Acts, and I believe it's 17, maybe you don't have to check me on this, I'm sorry, but he said in Acts, I know this, for in him, God, in him we live and move and have our being. Can I just submit this to you, what I believe now? I believe when we walk outside, feel a breeze of wind blow across us. That is the Holy Spirit of God. Remember, God is both physical and spiritual. That's why he said you, he compared the wind and the Holy Spirit as one and used the same word. Is God confused? Mm-mm. And he's trying to tell us, you can't see him, you know, but you feel him. He's all around you all the time. He's literally the air, I believe, the air we breathe. <laughs> can, I, can I just throw something in here? Go right ahead. Okay. Um, <laughs> you remember when Jesus came walking out and they thought he was a ghost? Right. And then Peter said, Lord, it was you busy to come. Thank you, Craig. Father, we thank you for him again. Continue to bless him, Father. Let not one prayer, Father, that he 
praise, Father, according to your will. Let it not fall to the ground, Lord. Uphold them and uplift them, Father, we pray. in Jesus. Thank you. Thank you. Amen. I appreciate that. How are you? How are you feeling? You, you moving around? <laughs> Amen. Well, I hope that, uh, let me ask you this real quick. That, um, the first go around, some of you have heard this now twice, and of course this was a little more than last time. Did this help even more, you to get a hold of it a little bit better? <laughs> Well, these are same, and again, because the men who have the technology to go to the Antarctic, to go as high up as we can go, um, because they have suppressed certain truth, things are, are withheld. We're really left to kind of try to figure out some of these things on our own, but there, there's some basic truth that we, one thing we can just know, they're lying. Now, I know some of them are just deceived because, you know, first, 2 Timothy 3 talks about in the last days, and he's talking about perilous times, he says there will be people who, he said they will, deceivers who are deceiving and being deceived would increase. So some of them are the, de the, the top deceivers, and some of them are just being deceived by the top deceivers. Isn't that what happens in Freemasonry anyway? The lower ones don't really know what the higher ones know, but all, all of them are being deceived. But some are deceiving and being deceived. So you got the same thing going on there. Um, but there's still, I got a lot to learn. But um, let, me, let me tell you this real quick. There is a guy, and this is just for us, that I would suggest if you want to get the book, it's got a lot of evidence in it. His name is Eric Dubay. Now, he is not a Christian. Okay? Um, but he has done a lot of his homework on this issue. He does believe in God. He, he's really strange. I don't know. He, he's, he's, he's into yoga. He's into some other things. I think God's trying to bring him around. But he, he's fully on board with this truth. But he's got a book called The Flat Earth Conspiracy. And it's just chock full of information. Um, that's a good place to start. Um, uh, but there's some other Christian as Rob Skiba. S-K-I-B-A. He's got a really good site. And he is, he is truly a Christian minister, and he and I are just like a year apart. I think I'm a year older than him. And he, um, he's really examined this for some time, biblically broken it down, and, and he's got a really good blog page on this subject covering it, and he does a lot of videos. So he's a safe one. Dubay... Again, you have to eat some hay and spit out the sticks, but, but Dubay is really a lot of good information. I just started going through his book just in the last couple of days. I just bought it like Friday, I think. D-U-B-A-Y, I believe. Just look up Flat Earth Conspiracy Book. You can get, if you want an e-book, it's $9.99. I, I don't know how much. But now he gets into some other things. He's got a book called The Atlantean Conspiracy. I would just kind of stay away from some of his other ones. Stay completely away from Mr. Lord Stephen Christ. He is, I believe he's probably a government troll more than anything else because he's psycho. But now, he does put out some truth. You know, there's another thing happened, another phenomenon that's proven the don't. And that is a thing called mega cryo, uh, how do you say it? Mega cryo meteorite or mega cryo something. But anyway, these huge, massive, Chunks of ice that have flat surfaces on one side are falling to the earth in different places when the sky is clear and blue. Going through houses and roofs, crushed. I saw one crush uh, a Mustang roof, just crushed it. Again, think about it. A glass dome, we know I've flown at 40,000 feet, and up there it'll say minus 55 degrees at 40,000 feet. All right? Moisture that goes all the way up to the dome in places, just like your windshield, you get ice on it, and then fall. I know there's some big chunks of ice falling. Now think about this. The Bible says in the end, think about this. God is going to basically rend the heavens, it says, and roll it back like a scroll. 
At the same time, that's what Isaiah says, at the same time, Revelation says, at the seventh vial of wrath, hundred pound hailstones are going to begin to fall. Mm -hmm. Where are those hailstones, ice stones, where are they coming from? Is that the dome? And that's why you see this new series, Under the Dome, Stephen King's novel, Under the Dome. The mall, the mall, they know it. They know it. They know it's there. And you know what makes them so angry? Limited. See, I'm going to give you another, one more little nugget to chew on, and I'm going to let you, you go. We'll go. You know the Bible talks about the four corners of the earth. I saw the angels standing at the four corners of the earth, say, holding back the winds. But no, let me, let me explain it. Remember, he drew a circle. What did he draw a circle on? And I'm going to tell you why I believe it's a square. The new Jerusalem that's going to descend down from heaven? What is it? It's a cube, square. And when God inscribed the circle, that's why in that giver, Trevor, the movie, he says, the earth, he said there was more. And the Bible talks about it in, in Proverbs 8. It says about, about rejoicing in the habitable parts of the earth. Oh, wait a minute, you mean there's more to the earth? There's more. Out there, yeah, the corners where he cut the circle and the angels stand there ready to release the four winds of God's judgment into our world, Revelation 7. You know what's so funny? I, you, yesterday, when you you shared, it was either yesterday or the day before, I can't remember now, it's all a blur, but you shared, I guess you shared for the, the service, and I happened to look at your page. Is that a picture of? Okay. Did you look real close at that picture? The picture that you have for your Facebook, the clouds behind the sun. It is. I thought that was interesting. <laughs> Look, thank y'all so much. And this is what I say with anything that's preached. Go and study yourself. Look up the scriptures. Look up the scriptures that compare. Do your own research. And I tell, and I tell everybody, this one guy does a video and he says this. Anybody see Fight Club? Remember Fight Club back with Brad Pitt? When he was telling Ed North, he said, the first rule of Fight Club is that we don't talk about Fight Club. <laughs> All right? If you just run off in the world and start yelling, the world's flat, people are going to be calling folks with the, with the white coat. Okay? Mm -hmm. See that cloud right there? Yeah. It's behind it. Fair enough. I just happened to notice that looking at your page. <laughs> but you know why? We, I think it's, we, we are so trained to just let everything pass by. But uh, we don't. We... we what, what, what was the quote from, from Kristoff in Truman Show? We accept the reality of the world with which we are presented. And that's what we have done instead of believing God. All of us believed in NASA instead of believing God. All of us sitting in this room. Everyone. And you know, is it? Here's the thing. What was it? I think it was even even Orwell, George Orwell, or somebody made this statement. They said. When something to the effect, I can't remember it exactly, but but when lies are so entrenched, telling the truth becomes an, an absolute act of rebellion. 
to the whole system. 